you. Again. <clears throat> Just to highlight, David has been a previous speaker here, so I obviously wanted to get him back. Uh, so, David, thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Michael. I appreciate the opportunity to come back a second time. Uh, the first time I was here, my book hadn't come out yet, and so uh, I wrote that after I was here the last time. Uh, and thanks for the, uh, to the uh, Broomfield Veterans Museum for the opportunity to come back again. Uh, just a, a quick footnote before we get started here. I chose Reign of Ruin for the title of this presentation. Some of you, in fact, I was just speaking to a gentleman here a little while ago who was 11 years old at the time that the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, I have a similar memory. I was 11 years old when JFK was assassinated. <clears throat> anyway, one of the famous things that uh, Truman said at the time announcing the atomic bomb had dropped was that if the Japanese didn't surrender, that we would, they, could f they would face a rain of ruin from the sky, the like of which had never been seen before. Rain as spelled R-A-I-N. Because of the nature of my book, which focuses on the leadership in both Japan and the United States during the final months of the war, and I squarely place the blame for what took place on the Japanese leadership, I like the title Reign, R-E-I-G-N, of Ruin for the name of this talk. So anyway, that's, that's how that, that came about. I didn't get to choose the name of the title for my book. My publisher did that. Okay. Okay, before we get into some of the specifics as to what took place, we need a little bit of context. And one of the things that had been in play since uh, 19, for, January of 1943 was a demand by the Allies of the Axis powers, so Germany, Japan, and Italy, that they would, we would only accept their surrender unconditionally, which basically means that there were not going to be any terms prior to them accepting surrender. Accepting unconditional surrender is the equivalent of accepting by the, the vanquished uh, that they're going to be, um, a revolution is going to take place essentially diplomatically or politically within their country. In other words, the winners, the allies in this particular case, are going to tell them what sort of government they're going to have in the future. They're going to get rid of the people who took them into this destructive, aggressive war in the first place. Does that make sense? Okay. Most wars do not end in this fashion. The vast majority of wars end with terms that are negotiated between the warring powers. This is very unusual. One of the key aspects of unconditional surrender is occupation. The reason that occupation is necessary is because in order to enforce the changes that you want, in this case on Germany, Japan, and Italy, you need to occupy that country. Okay. Unconditional surrender, its genesis comes from Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy at the end of World War I under Wilson at that point in time. And that particular war ended with an armistice. The Allies formalized, as I said a moment ago, uh, the, uh, the unconditional demand in January of 1943. And the reason FDR, a couple of the reasons that FDR pointed out was that we are fighting this war because we did not have unconditional surrender, as I mentioned a moment ago, at the end of World War I. Treaty of Versailles turned out to be a failure. And he said, reiterated in, Jan in July of 1944, that practically all Germans deny the fact that they surrendered during the last war, but this time they are going to know it. And so are the Japs. The legacy of unconditional surrender was inherited by President Truman upon the death of FDR in April of 1945. And one of the first things that Truman did was in a, joint, in a uh, session of the Joint uh, co of Congress, that he announced that he was going to uphold basically the principles that FDR had stood for, and one of those was unconditional surrender. Okay, switching to Japan. One of the things that was a literally almost a mainstay in, in Japan during the 20th century was political assassination. It had become very common and was typically carried out by middle grade officers within the military. Just from 1909 to 1936, so the immediate run-up 
to Japan's entry into World War II, which you could really say for them was in 1937 when they attacked China. Five prime ministers, two generals, and an admiral were assassinated by these middle grade officers. The coercion by these officers was so common that the Japanese actually came up with a word for it, geiku kojo, which meant overpowering the higher ranks by the lower ranks or manipulation of superiors by subordinates. This is something that went on throughout Japan all the way up literally until the end of the war in 1945. And the senior officers never completely put an end to this. Japanese government. So the, the components of the Japanese government at this point in time were the emperor, who was considered divine, the military oligarchy, which comprised of, when I say military oligarchy, everybody's familiar with the, the word oligarchy. It basically means the government or, or the, uh, that a handful of leaders are running the country. In this particular case, virtually all of them are military. So the components of that are prime minister, uh, and who is chosen by the emperor, prime minister's cabinet, partially chosen by the prime minister, and partially chosen by incumbents. Decisions required a unanimous vote. So what does this mean? It means that all of the members of that leadership group have to vote together, or each one of each, in other words, each one of them has the power of veto. In other words, if they don't vote unanimously, any single one of them would cause the issue to fail. This was uh, manifested in a very dysfunctional form of government, as you may, might uh, guess. Failure to come to, as I said, uh, could cause would cause there also that failure. I'm sorry, could cause either the resignation or the toppling of a government. Resignation by a member of the, of the uh, leadership group. Decisions were presented to the emperor for his sanction, which meant that he knew about all the decisions, but he wasn't an active participant in the decision-making process under normal circumstances. On July 22, 1944, Hideki Tojo who is the leader of Japan at the beginning of the war, the guy that you're probably most familiar with, was forced to resign after the loss of Guam, Saipan, and Tinian in the Marianas Islands uh, that summer. After his, uh, he was forced to resign, two other prime ministers would serve during the remainder of the war, the last year of the war in the Pacific. We're gonna focus our attention on the last of those prime ministers as we move forward. The other thing that did get created by the first of those prime ministers, a guy by the name of Kosoa, was the creation of what's called the Big Six. The Big Six was a superset of the cabinet in Japan. There were six members of that group that would be essentially making all the decisions in Japan during the final months of the war. So who were those people? Well, up in the upper left-hand corner, you see Emperor Hirohito. In the middle there is Kantaro Suzuki. He was the prime minister. To his right is Korichika Anami, a general. In the lower left is Yoshigiro Imuzu, also a general. To his right, Somiya Toyota. To his right, uh, Mitsumasu Yonai, also an admiral. And to the far right down here is Shigenori Togo, the foreign minister. The only civilian member of this superset called the Big Six. Like I said, even though I show uh, Emperor Hirohito up here, these are the six men that I'm referring to when I say the Big Six, okay? Even uh, Suzuki is a former admiral. So in the, on the U.S. side, as I said, Franklin Roosevelt had just passed away, so you've got Harry Truman in the upper left. I wanna say right, because I'm looking at it that way, upper left. In the middle is James Byrne, it's his Secretary of State. In the upper right is James Forrestal, Secretary of Navy. Down here is Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, Chief of Staff to Truman, uh, Admiral William Leahy, and over here is General George Marshall. So those are the guys on the American side who are we'll say primarily the decision makers. Obviously, they, we have a different form of government than the Japanese, but those were the guys who were our closest advisors to Truman during the final months of the war.
the atomic bomb. At the time Truman takes over as President of the United States, FDR has done almost nothing to bring him up to speed on what's going on. And so the atomic bomb is something that he knows virtually nothing about. On April 25th, Stimson and General Leslie Groves, who was the head of the Manhattan Project, brief the president. Stimson tells the president a couple of things. Within four months, we shall in all probability have completed the most terrible weapon ever known in human history. And the world in its present state of moral advancement compared to its technical development would eventually be at the mercy of such a weapon. Pretty foreboding. However, what it does say, if you read between the lines there, and Truman is a guy who has a war to win at this point in time, as terrible as this weapon is, I may just be giving you a weapon that will help you end the war. The last year of the war, experienced the, la the bloodiest year of the war. So leading up to the last year of the war, the war in the Pacific was largely a naval war. Uh, we had a number of small battlefields on islands that were bloody, usually not particularly long, and didn't involve huge numbers of men. In the final year of the war, beginning with the Guam, Saipan, and Tinian that I mentioned a moment ago that led to Tojo's uh, loss of power in Japan, we have those three battles during the summer of 1944. These are taking place, by the way, at the exact same time that the D-Day invasion has taken place in Europe. Okay? So on the opposite side of the world, the United States has this vast invasion set, series of invasions that begin in the Pacific, really ramping up the scale of battles in the Pacific. Okay? That's followed by Peleliu, meaning the Marianas, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. That's followed by Peleliu in the fall, and as well as the Philippines. And in the late winter, it becomes uh, Iwo, and spring, it becomes Iwo Jima and Okinawa. You also have the largest naval engagements in the war taking place during this period of time, also during the Battle of Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. It's called the Battle of the Philippine Sea, also known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot because we destroyed so many Japanese flyers during that battle. You also have the Battle of the Philippine Sea as part of the battle to take the Philippines, which was a huge, the largest naval battle in history. And you also have a large naval battle taking place around Okinawa as we take we attempt to take Okinawa. <laughs> and so you, what you see this translate into is these are the total number of casualties for all services during uh, the Pacific War. And this is how much, how many of them took place in the last year of the war. 64%, almost two-thirds of the casualties take place in the last year of the war as it's really ramping up in its scale. And then in terms of killed in action, you have 53,000 out of the 101,000 killed in action, or 53% 53 of the deaths take place in the last year of the war. The American strategic bombing campaign. We keep going back to Guam, Saipan, and Tinian because it becomes really, really important to the United States. So the strategic bombing campaign for the United States, it actually had begun in China during 1943, but it was completely ineffective. It was actually costing more in gasoline than it was that we could actually drop in bombs. Highly ineffective. When we take Guam, Pan, Guam Saipan, and Sidian, and Tinian, they're about 1,300 miles away from the Japanese home islands. And they are a perfect place to bring our, the most sophisticated bomber of the war, the B-29 Super Fortress, which could fly up to almost 31,000 feet carry about 20,000 pounds in bombs or gas, depending on what, which, you want, which one you want to use, uh, and fly in a pressurized cabinet. It's by far and away the most sophisticated bomber of the war. Almost 4,000 of them were built at a cost of nearly $3 billion, Okay, 50% more than the Manhattan Project. The guy in the middle there is Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay takes uh, over for the uh, 20th Bomber Command in January of 1940. Five, and changes the tactics that are being used by the B-29s. Instead of flying daylight missions at high altitudes and not hitting really anything, highly effective campaign, the, bomber, or the campaign began just after Thanksgiving of 44. Okay. Uh, he decides to bring them in at night at altitudes of around five to 8,000 feet using primarily incendiary cluster bombs. 
And what happens is that on the night of March 9th and 10th of 1945, all this white area is actually flame. This is Tokyo burning on the night of March 10th, 1945. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 261,000 buildings are, and homes are destroyed. Approximately one quarter of Tokyo is burned to the ground. If I showed you photographs of that, and I showed you photographs of Hiroshima or Nagasaki, you'd be hard pressed to tell which one I was showing you. That's how flattened that part of Tokyo was. Approximately 84,000, nobody knows for sure, approximately 84,000 Japanese died that night. It was the single most destructive aerial attack in all of the war, in all theaters, including the atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These are photographs of the devastation. Those are charred corpses over there. This is Hirohito, nine days after the attack took place, walking through the streets of this part of Tokyo where this devastation had taken place. Oops. There we go. <clears throat> so what was the United States planning to do at this point in time? Well, the United States was planning to invade Japan proper. And in late May of 1945, they had, they had completed their plans and approved their plans for the invasion of Japan. It was called Operation Downfall and it had two phases. The first phase would be November 1st, 1945, Operation Olympic. I'll go to, into that in just a little bit more. And the second phase was Operation uh, Coronet uh, and its date was March 1st of 1946. So Operation Olympic, the first phase of that, November 1st, 1945, was going to include, it was, its objective was to take the lower one-third of Kyushu, which is the southernmost Japanese island in that chain that you saw just a moment ago. Let me go back for a second. So it's down here, okay? As a staging place for the second phase of uh, of downfall, which was Operation Coronet in the spring of 1946. It would have included over three quarters of a million Americans, 134,000 vehicles, a million and a half tons of supply, 22 fleet and 10 light aircraft carriers, and almost 2,800 aircraft. Not what you would call a small invasion by any stretch of the imagination. Coronet was even bigger. By the way, all that three quarters of a million men, they were already in the Pacific theater by that point in time. Now for this phase, and again, I was talking to, I think it was a lady here just a moment ago. Uh, her, bro was it a brother? Was back in the United States, but getting ready to be redeployed to the Pacific. He would have in all likelihood taken part in Coronet because the vast majority of this million men were either in training in the United States already and had never seen action, or were being redeployed from Europe to the United States, refitted, and they were going to get re against sent to the Pacific Theater. Over a million, 190,000 vehicles, 2.6 million tons of supplies, 42 aircraft carriers, and 3,300 planes. What were the Japanese going to do? Well, their plan for the defense of the home islands was called Ketsugo. And its first iteration really wasn't, it wasn't called Ketsugo, it was actually called Shogo. That plan was approved shortly after the loss of Guam, Saipan, and Tinian again, right? Okay. Uh, and by January of 1945, it became clear that they needed a broader, more far-reaching plan. Hirohito approved the new plans on January 19th, stating, I believe the war is certainly winnable if we make our best efforts, but I'm anxious about whether or not the people will be able to endure until then. Now keep in mind, by January of 1945, they had seen nothing but a string of defeats since the beginning, since the middle, midway, of 1942. Japanese weren't winning anywhere, okay? <laughs> and yet, this is still the opinion of the Emperor of Japan in January of 1945. Still a winnable war. Despite the fact that we had lost the Marianas again, and they were about, they were, even though we weren't effective yet, we were starting to bomb them with those B-29s, right? 
Japanese military leaders had correctly deduced, remember I said that uh, Coronet and Olympic were going to go after Kyushu and Coronet was going to go after the Tokyo plane. Japanese leaders figured that out. They knew that's where we were going to be going. And so they put the bulk of their defensive plans as far as Ketsu go, defensive forces in those areas. The plan called for a massive use of special attack suicide forces, which became official government policy. Okay? We're mandating that you be a suicide player in this defense of the home islands. Whoops, what happened? Oh, well, that was weird. Did I go back too far? Let's see. No, that's good. Okay. All right, so what did these things, what did Ketsugo look like? Approximately six million uh, members of the military, uh, Japanese soldiers, uh, seamen, airmen, would have been in the home islands by this point in time. 2,000 uh, conventional aircraft, and the reason I draw the distinction here is that those 2,000 conventional aircraft meant that those were pilots that were actually capable of flying real missions as opposed to being kamikaze pilots who were just going to crash themselves into something. That's the distinction I'm making here, okay? Below that, 10,000 actual kamikaze aircraft. And then the, uh, as I said, massive use of suicide forces. It wasn't just going to be aircraft crashing into things now. Now it was also going to be uh, naval uh, craft that were going to be smashed into things that would then explode. So what did the Japanese had? Well, they had these things over here, midget submarines, and they had these little guys up here who were literally going to wait in the shallows near the invasion beach areas. They had a 10 kil uh, kilogram charge, TNT charge, and all they had to do was basically push it up against the la whatever kind of uh, landing vessel was coming in. Typically, it would have been loaded with men, right? And it would explode. And so they were going to be doing it. There were thousands of those. And then last but not least, down here, they had little speedboats that they were going to ram into all of our naval vessels and explode them. Okay? The idea was to kill, obviously, as many Americans as they possibly could. In fact, that's the primary strategy in Ketsu Go, is that if you create enough American casualties, spill enough American blood, that we can get something better than unconditional surrender. That's that term again, right? They were unwilling to accept unconditional surrender, and they believed that if they bled the United States enough, that we would sue for terms. They could negotiate a peace that would be better than unconditional surrender. How about the civilian component of the Japanese defense? It wasn't going to be limited to just the members of the military. 28 million Japanese fell under a legally conscripted National Volunteer Corps that included women in the ages of 17 to 40, men ages 15 to 60. And if that weren't enough, the Aikigo Defense League, south of Tokyo, stockpiled 10,000 of these little things, they're ceramic, and they were filled with an explosive, and children under the ages of 14 and 15 were going to carry these things into battle and explode themselves among the Americans. Now, keep in mind, in the two battles that the United States had fought the Japanese, where there was a significant civilian population, Saipan, here we go again, right, and Okinawa, on Saipan, you had a population of approximately 25,000 civilians on that island, and somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 7,000 died during the Battle of Saipan. On Okinawa, out of a population of 450,000, the estimates are on the low side 50 to as much as 150,000 of the civilians died during Okinawa. We're going to see a bloodbath beyond anything that they were seeing there. Take those kinds of percentages and multiply them times the population of Japan, and you're putting these people directly into the line of fire. Invasion casualties. This is something that gets hotly debated, and let's cover the whole spectrum of things. 
In March of 1945, America's draft call had nearly doubled to 140,000 men per month in anticipation of a soon-to-be one-front war. Why do I say that? Because in May, the war ended with Germany, right? So they're drafting in anticipation of the invasion of Japan. It's unmistakable evidence by the American military of just how bad the casualties would have been. Truman and Stimson were aware of the Humer to Truman memo dated May 30th, 1945, citing half a million to one million Americans killed. That was authored by what were called the smart colonels in the Pentagon. So this is not some idle number that Hoover came up with. He was is still involved with the intelligence community and the military community of the United States, even well after his presidency, obviously. That's the number that he gave to them. Truman took that and circulated it among a number of his senior advisors to get the reaction. None of them really took issue with the numbers. A War Department study projecting, now so, by the way, this is, this half a million to a million killed, typically the casualty numbers are four times the death toll. So here we have down here in the War Department, which is almost echoing the same, same information, 1.7 to 4 million casualties, 400 to 800,000 killed. Now, to put this in perspective, this is the number. 400,000 that the United States lost in all of World War II. And they're projecting losses that could double or triple those numbers in the invasion of Japan. General Marshall originally gave uh, Truman a, a relatively, well, he gave him an estimate for only 30 days. And it was a relatively, back on June 18, 1945, when downfall was first presented to Truman. And he gave him a relatively low estimate at that point in time. At Potsdam, he came back with an estimate of 250 to 100,000 casualties. Lower than these numbers, but still very, very high. Estimates by American planners of Japanese dead, 5 to 10 million. Japanese planners put the number at 20 million as part of Ketsu Go. And that was acceptable. It was part of the plan. Other casualties that almost never get talked about. At the end of World War, uh, at the end of the war, the Japanese still held over 200,000 American military, I'm sorry, I should say allied, not American exclusively, 200,000 uh, military and civilian prisoners of war. The POW, the military POWs were dying at exceptionally appalling rates, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30%. Practically one out of three were dying. Around 11% of the civilians were dying. All of those men, women, and perhaps children were at risk as long as the war continued. And in fact, in terms of the military prisoners of war, the Japanese had a kill order out on, Amer on allied POWs since August of 1944. At a place called uh, Cabana Tuan in... Uh, let me, I'm sorry, uh, what's, I can't think of the other one right now. In uh, December of 1944, the Japanese actually liquidated an American prisoner of war camp that had about 150 uh, Palawan. Thank you, I finally got that. 150 American prisoners, killed them all. Just as, herded them into fake bomb shelters, doused them with gasoline, and machine gunned them to death. Okay? Miraculously, a couple of those guys actually escaped, got back to American lines, and informed, ultimately, MacArthur of this. And if you've ever seen, there's a movie out there called The Great Raids, an excellent movie. Uh, they actually, the Americans send a group of rangers in, in uh, late January of 1945, to Cubanatuan, prisoner of war camp. Both of these are in the Philippines. And they rescue over 500 American prisoners of war. So anyway, they were under a, uh, the potential to be killed all the way until the war ended. Additionally, there were millions of Asians and Western Pacific natives living in Japan's Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Boy, if that isn't a misnomer. 
dying at a rate of 100,000 to 250,000 per month. And by the way, this is a number that had been going on throughout the entirety of the war. This isn't just now. They've been dying at this rate throughout the Pacific War. According to a United Nations study, after the war, the number could have been as high as 400,000 a month. Contemporary estimates for the death toll for the bombings on Hiroshima and Nagasaki are 129,000 to 226,000. I need to move over. Oh, sorry. I keep getting out of camera. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so those, uh, the big six that we started talking about here a little while ago, I'm going to go back to them for a little bit. They, uh, that uh, Suzuki's government. Uh, was formed in uh, early April, April 7th of 1945. About a month later, on April 11th, the group gets together and for the first time actually discusses the possibility of bringing the war to an end. Togo, being the foreign minister, a foreign minister and the only, guy, the only civilian and really the guy who's pushing for this uh, end to the war, brings up the issue and basically gets almost no support for the idea. He brings it up in the context of they've just got one of the worst economic reports in terms of the status of the country and its military that they've ever seen. And yet the other members of the big six, those other five guys, basically want none of it. He finally gets them to concede that we need to start doing something and so they decide of all countries to approach to approach the Soviet Union. I'll say of all countries because I'll give you the context on that in just a second. Anyway, they basically think, well, some of them believe that they can actually approach the Soviets and get them to maybe even join the war with them, but at a minimum, maybe get aircraft, petroleum, and other kinds of supplies that would help support the Japanese war effort. Now, here's the history of the Japanese and the Soviets during the 20th century. From 1904 to 1904, they fought the Russo-Japanese War. Japanese emerged victorious from that. From 1935 to 1939, they fought a series of battles along the Manchuria border. By this point in time, the Japanese are occupying Manchuria. They have almost essentially annexed it as part of Japan, even though it's Manchuria is part of modern day China. Okay, it's in Northeast China today. Okay. In 1940, Hirohito labels the Russians as untrustworthy. On April 13th, the Soviets and the Japanese, to avoid a dual, a two-front war. Now, in this time frame, the, Russian, or the Germans have not attacked the, uh, the uh, Soviets yet. That doesn't happen until June. So this is a couple of months before, but the Soviets are anticipating the possibility of getting into the war, uh, probably against Germany, even though at this point in time, they're technically an ally of the Germans. Okay. <laughs> And the Japanese, likewise, don't want to fight a dual front war. And so they sign a non-aggression, a neutrality pact with each other so they won't fight each other. Okay? In November of 1944, now we're well into the war, Stalin brands the Japanese as an aggressor state side by side with Germany. In February of 1945, Japanese intelligence all right, Japanese intelligence and former Prime Minister Hideki Tojo both tell the Emperor that the Soviets will in all likelihood abrogate the neutrality pact and attack them when it becomes convenient for them to do so. In the spring of 1945, the Kwantung Army is, is the big army, a Japanese army in Manchuria, see vast, massive uh, Soviet arms and men moving east. Well, east is toward Japan and toward its Kwantung army in Manchuria, okay? In April of uh, 5th of 1945, the Soviets informed the Japanese that they would not be renewing that neutrality pact that they signed back in April of 1941. Still had a year left to run, and they're telling them that now. And the year before, remember, Stalin had let, uh, labeled them an aggressor state. In May of 1945, the mission of the now gutted Kwantung Army, that's the big army again in Japan, gutted, when I say that, it's because of this. They have been long since sending out its best divisions to fight the Americans on some of these island battles, battlefields. 
Also, in, uh, as part of Ketsu Go in May of 1945, they sent six divisions out of, uh, from the Kwantung Army, three to went to Korea, three to went to Japan to, as part of Ketsu Go. So they changed the orders of the Kwantung Army in anticipation of fighting the Soviet Union to a strategic withdrawal to the northern part of Korea. Japanese communications. Remember I said they, Togo finally got permission to, to and, they were, and they decided, despite all what I just told you, they decided that they were going to pursue uh, a, a peace feelers or looking for ways to end the war with the uh, Soviet Union. So they began a series of communications from Togo, that's the foreign minister up in the upper right there, to Sato, that's the, so, the Japanese ambassador to the Soviet Union, he's in Moscow. A series of communications begins between those two. The communications, the United States had long since broken the diplomatic and military codes of the Japanese. The most notable of those are Midway, I'm sure that everybody's heard of, right? And the second one was and actually in the shoot down of Yamamoto, who was the planner of Pearl Harbor. They actually assassinated him. They broke the codes. They knew where he was going to be. They sent 16 P-38s after him, and they got him. <laughs> anyway, they're breaking their codes. In June of 1945, American code breakers began monitoring this series of messages that I was referring to. <coughs> Minister Togo and Japan's ambassador to the Soviet Union, Anake Osato. OK, I already said that. OK, Togo's messages to Sato about the Japanese intentions were endlessly vague. In other words, despite the fact that he's been allowed to begin doing this, the reality of it is they're not giving him, him anything. And when I say that, I mean the big six. They're not giving him anything to really negotiate with. In other words, they're not really giving him any real concessions that the Soviet Union would respond to. Now, keep in mind by this point in time as a sideline, at Yalta, a couple months earlier, in February of 1945, FDR, Stalin, and Churchill had met. And as one of the things that came out of there, Stalin agreed that the Soviet Union would enter the war against the Japanese 90 days after the end of the war in Europe. The war in Europe ends on May 8th. 90 days after that would be August 8th, that they would enter the war against the Japanese. So regardless of what gets sent, the reality of it is the, Ger or the Russians are not the least bit interested. But nevertheless, he is sending this. It's really vague. Sought to an incredibly blunt language. States comes back after one of the messages saying, the reasoning behind your messages on the 11th consists of nothing more than academic fine phrases. In other words, the Soviets aren't going to be the least bit interested in the proposals that you're giving me because they're so vague. Okay. A week later, on, Jan on July 18th, Sato sent another message to Togo, this time declaring that the Japanese must accept the equivalent of unconditional surrender, accepting the preservation of the imperial polity, in other words, the emperor and the organization or uh, uh, structure associated with the uh, emperor. This is a really critical communication because then Togo sends back three days later he says that with regard to unconditional surrender, we are unable to consent to it under any circumstances whatsoever, including the preservation of the imperial polity. Okay? July of 1945, we have the first successful test of the atomic bomb at Alamoguardo on the 16th. On the following day, and uh, Truman gets word of that when he's at Potsdam now. The, so they got the Potsdam conference going on just outside of Berlin. And uh, Truman and, uh, I'm sorry, not Truman at that point in time. Yeah, sorry, Truman, uh, Stalin, and Churchill. I was thinking of Churchill having to leave after a while. Uh, recommits to that same promise that he made to FDR at Yalta, which was to join the war against the Japanese uh, 90 days after the end of the war in Europe. So he recommits to that. Truman, Truman gets that confirmation from him. Com uh, the conference uh, includes a declaration uh, on the 25th. And the declaration that goes to Japan actually contains terms, 13 of them. Only the last, the 13th, includes the reference to unconditional surrender. And unconditional surrender in this case is only applied to the Japanese military. So this is a departure. It's a softening. 
of the stance of the Allies given to Japan versus what they did to Germany. Germany accepted flat out unconditional surrender. We're not going to tell you anything that we're going to do. You're just going to accept unconditional surrender. So the Allies are actually softening their position by saying, here are our terms, 13 of them, only one of which refers to unconditional surrender specifically. Okay? That's key. And in fact, the reaction by the Japanese when they get this is even by the most moderate. Who's the most moderate? Togo sees this as a softening, a weakening of Allied resolve. President Truman greenlights the atomic bomb. Oh, I'm sorry, after you get this. On July 28th, uh, the, the Japanese react to the Potsdam Declaration. First in a, uh, in a, uh, in a pre uh, not a press release, but a uh, newspaper article earlier in the day. And then later in the afternoon, Suzuki actually holds a press conference. And he's asked, what are the uh, Japanese going to do relative to the Potsdam Declaration? And he says, this is a famous word, mokusatsu. And it means, if you actually literally break down the word, it literally means to treat with silent contempt. Okay? Now, there are a lot of people who have made it, uh, have made uh, comments about that the United States or the Allies didn't understand really what mokosatsu meant. Wasn't the obligation of the Allies to understand what that word means. It's the obligation of the Japanese to make clear what their position is. Okay? Okay, August 6th, what happens? Okay, the B-29 in Gay drops the first bomb, little boy bomb, on uh, Hiroshima. What is the reaction by the Japanese? Almost nothing. What they do do is they send their leading nuclear physicist, because they're not convinced that it was an atomic bomb. Now keep in mind, regardless of whether you believe it's an atomic bomb or not, what did it just do? One bomb destroyed an entire city. Regardless of whether it's atomic, that's the fact. They don't believe it's atomic. They've been told by this point now that Truman, right, he's that famous speech I was referencing earlier, that it is an atomic bomb. They send their top nuclear physicist to go there to investigate. And as a sideline, keep this in mind, the Japanese had two atomic programs of their own, one by the Army and one by the Navy during World War II. They both came to the conclusion that while it was feasible, it wasn't feasible during the context of what they thought the length of World War II would be. Okay. General Marshall, reading the latest decrypts, remember we're reading their political or diplomatic as well as their military uh, decrypts. So we're watching this incredible buildup on Kyushu. Now I remember I said Operation Olympic was the first phase going to take the lower one third of Kyushu as a staging place for the second phase, Coronet, in the spring of 1945. Olympic was based on 350,000 Japanese being on Kyushu. What's the number by this point? Try 900,000. And a huge buildup has taken place during just the time we, we approved this thing in May, end of May, until August on Kyushu. Marshall is so concerned about it, he does two things. He considers holding the supply of atomic bombs. And by the way, we didn't just have two. We were literally producing atomic bombs, not mass producing by any stretch of imagination. But we could have had as many as seven to nine by the time of that attack on uh, November 1st of 1945 in reserve. Marshall is thinking of holding them in reserve to use as tactical weapons to support the invasion of Kyushu over which Marines and American soldiers would have gone across an irradiated battlefield. That's how serious it was. He also asks MacArthur, does he think that the invasion is still viable considering these numbers, 900,000? MacArthur says, absolutely. He wanted, to, he wanted to be the person who led the largest invasion in human history. Okay. Okay. Uh, I covered all that. August 8th, with only silence from Japan's leaders, 
Truman agrees to further conventional attacks on Japan, hitting Iwata in this particular case with incendiaries with over 200 B-29s and destroying approximately a quarter of the city. In Tokyo, Togo meets with the emperor advising him to accept the terms of the Potsdam Declaration. Hirohito agreed and told Togo to inform Suzuki in light of the new weapon. Japan was now powerless to respond. Read between the lines, though. If it weren't for the weapon, he'd still be okay with fighting the decisive battle, Ketsugo, on Japanese soil. Suzuki called an emergency session of the Big Six, but the meeting had to be delayed a day till the 9th. Whoops, let me go back. Where did I go? Did I go too far? No. Oh, I did. Well, I really jumped forward, didn't I? Because more pressing, one of the members of the council had more pressing business. That's not a typo, folks. They delayed the meeting by a day because somebody in the big six had more pressing business to attend to. More pressing business than what? Right? Okay, August 9th. So, the Soviet Union enters the war against the Japanese by attacking the Kwantung army in Manchuria. And they're quickly rolling up, so to speak. You'll hear about this if you ever read about it at all. They're having their way with the Kwantung army. Why? Because what I told you a little while ago, right? They're gutted at this point in time, and they've changed their mission to a fighting withdrawal to the northern part of Korea. Vice Chief of Staff of the Imperial Army, Kawabe, writes in his diary that morning, the Soviets finally started this morning. My estimate was wrong, however. Now things have come to this, and we can give no thought to peace. It wasn't the Soviet attack that caused the Japanese to surrender. They anticipated that, okay? The Big Six finally meets and rapidly descends into stalemate. Suzuki, Yonai, and Togo want a single condition, the preservation of the imperial polity. They're willing to surrender on that basis. Anami, Imuzu, and Toyota were so confident, still, in the massive casualties that Ketsugo would cause the Americans, they demanded either the continuation of the war or four conditions. To end it. They're still demanding conditions even after the attack on Hiroshima. They don't know yet about their meeting, but they don't know yet about Nagasaki. And the Soviet Union have entered the war, and they're still saying we want to continue to fight Ketsugo, decisive battle on Japanese soil, or we want these four conditions. They want the preservation of the imperial polity as well, no or limited occupation, control over disarmament, and control over war crimes trials. During the meeting, at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, a second atomic attack takes place at, I'm sorry, it takes place in the morning at about 10.30, flattens a good part of Nagasaki. Just before word comes into the meeting that this has taken place, Toyota says that no country in the world can produce enough fissile material to mount such attacks threatened by Truman in that same speech. They may now expect a reign of ruin, right? Okay. So uh, what he's basically saying, again, read between the lines, if we don't have to fear another atomic attack, they don't know yet about Nagasaki when he said this, then Hiroshima is a casualty of war, just like all the other cities that have been destroyed by conventional bombing. In other words, we're willing to write them off. Shortly after he makes this statement, an aide comes into the room with news that the attack on Nagasaki has taken place by a bomb like the one that destroyed Hiroshima. What is the reaction by Anami, Amuzu, and Toyota? They still want to fight the war, or they want four conditions to end it. General Marshall believing, I said this already, General Marshall believing that the Jap Japan was not surrendering, wanted all the production of the uh, atomic bombs held for the invasion. The end run. The end run. So Suzuki, his secretary, and Togo managed to sort of outmaneuver the hardliners, Anami, Amuzu, and Toyota, and convoke an imperial conference 
An imperial conference is one where the emperor comes in and normally is just told what the decisions are that his leadership has made. In this particular case, they are bringing him in, and, they, and the hardliners don't know it. They're bringing him in with the idea of he's going to address an open issue, something that he almost never did, only one other time in 1936. Okay? And so he's going to get to express his opinion on an open issue where his leadership is deadlocked. In the early morning hours of the, eight, of the 10th, after hearing each side of the argument, the hardliners and the guys who were willing to just accept the preservation of the imperial polity, Emperor Hirohito says he's willing to accept ending the war with just a single condition, which actually turns out to be two conditions. It's with it's the preservation of the imperial polity, and this is really a key statement with the understanding that said declaration does not compromise any demand which prejudices the prerogatives of his majesty as sovereign ruler of Japan. What does that mean? It means that the emperor is still empowered to run the government just like the government that he was running when they went into war in 1941. It's an empowered emperor, absolutely key. Is that considered, or could that be considered acceptable in terms of unconditional surrender? You'd fought for almost three and a half years at this point in time, over three and a half years. Are you really willing to allow that government that took the Japanese into aggressive war to continue? Okay, they send it to the United States. Does Truman wait three days after an event before he calls his group together? The answer is no. He calls, he gets the information that they're potentially willing to surrender with conditions at 7.33 in the morning. He gets his guys together at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, Forrestal, Secretary of Navy, uh, Henry Stimson, Secretary of War, and James Burns uh, and Leahy are the in attendance. Marshall, for some reason, was unable to attend. Uh, Leahy, Forrestal, and uh, Stimson are willing to accept the Japanese offer, as is. Secretary of State Burns stands alone in angry opposition and says, no! He says, why should we accept this when we've proven to the Japanese we have this incredible new weapon, the atomic bomb, and the Soviet Union have just entered the war against the Japanese. Our position is stronger now than it was at Potsdam. And by the way, our allies will object if we agree to these terms. Forrestal says, okay, maybe we can change or come up with some language that will make it acceptable. Truman likes the idea, Burns drafts some changes. Okay, and here we are. So down at the bottom, these are the changes that Truman insists upon, I'm sorry, that Burns insists upon and, and uh, Truman ultimately agrees to. And by the way, there was one other component of this that I forgot. Anami says before they, he agrees to this because he's one of the guys that wanted the four conditions or continuing the war. He says, he asks Suzuki after this agreement has taken place, he said, what if the allies don't agree to these two conditions? What are you going to do? And Suzuki says, we're back to fighting the war. So here are the two conditions. From the moment of surrender, the authority of the emperor and the Japanese government to rule the state shall be subject to the supreme commander of the allied powers. Does that sound like, I'll give you an advance notice here, does that sound like something the Japanese are going to agree to? They want an empowered emperor. This is just saying the emperor is subject to, ultimately, MacArthur, the supreme allied commander. And... The ultimate form of government in Japan will be in accordance with the Potsdam Declaration established by the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. Does that sound like it protects the emperor either? No, that sounds like a new form of government to me, doesn't it? What do you think their reaction was? They say, no, we're not going to accept that. We're back to fighting the war. They bicker among themselves for two more days. Finally, a Hirohito convokes another imperial conference on his own. He doesn't have to have this sort of end run thing. He just calls one himself. And he says, I want to accept the Potsdam Declaration and what became known as the Burns Note with those two conditions that I just showed you a moment ago. In the immediate aftermath, General Anami 
arguably behind the emperor, really the most powerful guy in Japan, more so really than the uh, uh, prime minister. Just moments afterward, he considers three different times finding a way to basically stop the whole surrender process and keep the war going. He says, he says to Amuzu, Amuzu, do you believe that the war should be continued even at the risk of launching a coup d'etat? Amuzu says, no, the emperor has already decided. Minutes after that, Anami talks to his secretary, Hayashi, and says that the United States fleet is outside of Tokyo Bay. What do you think about attacking him with everything we have? Hayashi could barely believe his ears. <laughs> We've just been in this conference and the emperor has told you what he wants to do and you're still thinking about this? In the first place, it wasn't probably real anyway, but nevertheless, he did. And when he returns to the war ministry, he's, he comes in contact with his son-in-law, Takayashi. Takashida, I'm sorry. General Amuza, Takashida says, General Amuza has just changed his mind. Nami replied, is that so? But everything has already been decided. Takashida pleads, act, uh, at least resign from the cabinet to dissolve the Suzuki government. Remember I said a resignation could also topple a government when we were talking about the Japanese form of government. Get me some ink. I will write my resignation, says Anami. But as quickly as his vacillation flipped again, and if I do, I will never see the emperor again. So he didn't do any of these three things. But in the immediate aftermath, so this is six days. Now, I'm sorry, nine days. Eight, I'm sorry, eight days. Eight days after Hiroshima, okay? And the Soviets have entered the war. Two atomic bombs have been dropped, and he still wants to continue fighting. This is how difficult it was for the Japanese leadership to finally end the war, even with their emperor telling them twice. On August 15th, we're still not done. <laughs> Just after midnight, a group of middle grade officers, there they are again, right? Officers launched a coup headed by Kenji Hatanaka, this guy right here. They managed to seize the imperial grounds, which is where the emperor lives, essentially taking him hostage, albeit they never intended him any harm. They think he's being duped by his leadership. They attempt to get General Mor uh, Mori, who is uh, in, uh, commander of the Imperial Guards, to join them. When he refuses, they assassinate him and his brother-in-law, who happens to be in the office at the same time, hacking him up with a samurai sword. They forge orders using Mori's seal and attempt to gain the, the support of other senior officers in the Japanese military, but fail. At the same time, other members of the plot go to the homes of Suzuki and Toko with the intention of assassinating both of them, since they're the guys primarily involved with the peace faction. Neither man is home, and so they fail in doing that. They go to the imperial household memory, looking to destroy the imperial rescript recordings uh, after the surrender, or after the decision to surrender by uh, Hirohito on August 14th. He records two recordings Imperial rescripts is what they're called, that will, are supposed to be played at noon Japanese time on August 15th. By the way, the anniversary is today in the United States, the 14th of the surrender. Uh, they go to the uh, Imperial Household Registry and try to find those recordings. One of the individuals who was involved with recording has the intelligence to put the recordings in a place where they can't be easily found puts them in a safe, covers them up with a bunch of books and papers and stuff like that. And coincidentally, at the same time that this is taking place, the last bombing mission by the United States of the war passes by Tokyo. And the, and the Japanese are fearful that the next atomic attack, because now they believe that we have more than two of these bombs, right? Black out the city. And so the conspirators, conspirators are going nuts inside this building trying to find these rescript in a blacked out building and are unable to find them. Still later in the morning, Hatanaka, after failing to get other members of the Japanese military to join his coup, goes to a radio station and attempts to get them to allow him to broadcast uh, their message basically to the Japanese people. Another member of the coup, uh, Ida, goes to uh, Anami's home uh, to try to convince him to support the coup. 
He's known of the coup all along. He hasn't supported it, but he hasn't quashed it. Anami has decided by this point in time that he is going to commit seppuku. In other words, ritualistic suicide, where you disembowelment, okay? And so he does that a little before 6 o'clock in the morning, and as the whole conspiracy completely falls apart, most of the other members of the coup also commit suicide. And at noon on the 15th, Japanese time, the Japanese hear for the first time the recorded voice of their emperor, Hirohito. Hirohito never used the word surrender in his speech that day. Instead, he told them that the war had developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. A classic understatement if ever I've heard one. He added that Japan had not fought the war to aggrandize itself, its territory, but rather to ensure Japan's self-preservation, and this one really catches my eye, the stabilization of East Asia. Now, I told you a little while ago, people were dying at a rate of, at a minimum, 100 to 250,000 a month in this same area, possibly as high as 400,000. But this is his statement about that. Regarding the atomic bomb, he says, the enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable. Should we continue to fight, it would not only result in the ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. So what he's saying here is the Japanese, being such a benevolent people, are going to fall on their sword for the rest of humanity to preserve them, and so that's why they're going to capitulate. If you notice a little sarcasm here, it's with good reason. So Emperor Hirohito is why the war ended when it did. And he said so on eight different, I mean, sorry, four different occasions. On August 8th, in, the comment, in his comment to Togo, on August 15th, in the speech that I just talked to you about, in the letter to his son, no apology, by the way, for the war here, let me say a few words about the reason for our defeat. Our people placed too much confidence in the emperor and held England and American contempt. Our military placed too much emphasis on spirit and not science. Clearly a reference to the atomic bomb, okay? And last but not least, on September 7th, Hirohito told MacArthur that the peace party did not prevail until the bombing of Hiroshima created a situation which could be dramatized. What happened there again? <sighs> okay. Defeat versus surrender. Uh, it is both, in both the United States and Japan has often argued that Japan was virtually defeated nation in August of 1945 and thus the atomic bombs were not necessary. This argument confuses defeat with surrender. Defeat is a military fait accompli whereas surrender is the formal acceptance of defeat by the nation's leaders, an act of decision making. After the loss of Saipan in early July of 1945 brought Japan within range of B-29 bombers, its defeat had become certain, and Japan's leaders knew this. But because of the government machinery was, to a large extent, controlled by the military and hampered by a cumbersome system that required unanimity of views for any decision, Japanese leaders failed to translate defeat into surrender. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. Well, what's your thought around this time of year? Uh -huh. you know, all the news channels, whatever, always show something of Hiroshima and the ceremonies going on there. And it always kind of presents it as a horrible crime, mm -hmm. in a sense, killing mass people, and a number of people obviously is, but there's hardly ever mentioned that that's what really helped end the war and save so many other lives. That's typical. Uh, I mean, so your question, I mean, well, what do I think about that? Uh, the fact that it's sort of one-sided in terms yeah, of its portrayal of the end of the war? Well, I think it's unfortunate, but uh, even last year at the 75th anniversary, uh, I did manage to write a couple of articles that got published, um, and I was kind of watching to see what else was coming out in other newspapers, and, and I think it was the New York Times, the LA Times, 
uh, you saw the same sort of revisionist historians. The reason, by the way, in my opinion, that the controversy remains even to this day is because these revisionist historians continue to theorize with you know, why the war ended and how the war ended when it did. And there were, there were really, let me just cover them real quick. Here are the four major ones that they have. And then I'll tell you why I think this is, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They, they claim that the casualty estimates uh, provided by Truman and Stimson were after the war justifications, the half a million to a million American lives potentially lost in an invasion that the real estimates by the American military were substantially less than that. Well, I showed you on a slide all the things that Truman knew at the time. Those were not post-war uh, 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 I mean, uh, creations to justify the use of the atomic bomb. That's the first one. The second one that's become fairly popular more recently was that it was the Russian entry into the war that caused the Japanese to uh, sue for surrender. Well, as I just showed you, the main threat uh, in terms of the Soviets was in Manchuria, not Japan. Uh, and they were attacking the Kwantung army. Now they, make, they make a lot of the fact that they were really rolling up the Japanese during that period of time. Well, I told you, they were being gutted and their mission had already been changed to a strategic withdrawal to northern Korea. Okay? They were still taking a lot of prisoners. Fine, they did that. But the threat in Manchuria isn't like a threat in Japan itself whether you're talking about the conventional bombing done by the United States or the atomic bombing of the United States done in Japan, that's a real threat to the Japanese people themselves. Manchuria is in China, okay? As far as another one that they like to add on top of that, they make it sound like the uh, Soviet army was capable of an invasion of Japan itself, specifically Hokkaido, which is the northernmost Japanese island and the closest to the Soviet Union. Well, the problem for the Soviets is this. They're an incredibly powerful land army, large, realistically the most powerful at the time. However, they have zero amphibious capability, and you've got to get across water in order to get into Hokkaido. Now, Stalin actually considered a possible invasion of Hokkaido, and his own generals told him there is no way that we can do this at this point in time, and the losses to the Japanese, because they had formidable defenses even in Hokkaido, even though Kyushu and Honshu were the most heavily fortified, we can't do it. And it would have taken such a large force that would have jeopardized the force that we used to attack the, the Kwantung army in Manchuria. So that one doesn't hold any water either. The next one was atomic diplomacy meaning that the uh, Truman uh, dropped the bombs on them to basically get the, the Soviet Union to behave better in the post-war era. Well, the, re the reality of it is this, and they usually use James Burns because he's the one, remember I just told you, that came up with the two conditions uh, that, uh, wanted, that he, they wanted to force Japan to have to accept. Well, the reality was by, by getting those two conditions, he actually potentially prolonged the war. And as you saw, the Japanese went back into turmoil for two plus more days after they got that opportunity, after he sent that, uh, the changes that we wanted to the surrender process. Well, that actually delayed, obviously, the end of the war, potentially indefinitely. And the longer the war went on, because the Japanese had attacked the Kwantung army, the diplomatic situation for the Soviet Union actually potentially improved. <laughs> And so the idea that somehow Burns manipulated Truman into making that decision as a form of atomic diplomacy doesn't hold any water either. And the last uh, possibility was that the Japanese were ready to surrender without the atomic bomb. Well, as you just saw, what was the reaction by the big six after both atomic bombs had been dropped and the Soviet Union had entered the war? They went into a period for five more days where they fought amongst themselves and still didn't want to end the war. Even Anami contemplated ending, I mean, finding a way to stop it even after the emperor had intervened a second time, accepting. And so the idea that they were ready to surrender is, is just not the case. So my, the point, and really a large part of my book, is devoted toward showing you what these leaders are doing, the, dis the issues that they're facing, the decisions they're making. They're the ones who tell you how the war ended and why it did. There is no reason to theorize as these revisionists continue to want to do. The facts exist. Okay? Yeah. 
kind of interesting to uh, dovetail on what Mike was talking about. And uh, how controversial, as you mentioned, the, the dropping of the bomb became for like a, a certain period of time in the 1960s and 1970s. And what it reminds me of was the entire debate about the artifact, the Enola Gay, the aircraft itself and its presentation at the... Uh, Smithsonian. Yeah, the Smithsonian. That, that's actually in 95. That was on like the 40th. Yeah. Yeah, 50th, I'm sorry, anniversary. Yeah. And it was so interesting how that kind of became a tug of war between, you know, groups. And then eventually, which I think is really dispiriting, it wound up at the, the um, what's the name of the center that's outside of Washington, D.C.? Goodvar Housing. Thank you. Thank you. And, and there they just have no, you know, no context to it at all. It's just, the you know, yay. Which, you know, as a museum, I think it's sad. You have to have context. An yes. And they just kind of dumped it there because they wanted to evade any sort of controversy before that. Yes. But I was interested in what, you know, some of your, and if you mentioned that in your book too, you know, this, the Enola Gay, the bomber, and the, and the sort of what it symbolizes in the United States. What does it symbolize in the United States? Well, I, I, as you probably just put it, it's somewhat controversial to traditional uh, historians traditionalists, they would say that the use of the atomic bomb helped end the war much quicker and saved millions, literally millions of lives. Not just Japanese, not just American, but also, like I said, the Asians and the Pacific Islanders who were dying at terrible rates during the court. As long as the war went on, they were dying. And so it saved millions and millions of lives. And then you've got people on the revisionist side who, regardless of the logic of the argument, or regardless of what I tell you in the book, in other words, these guys said this about this, and that's how the war ended. In other words, it's their words. It's their decisions. They refuse to listen to the logic of the argument and simply make it an emotional one. There's no way you can justify use of an atomic bomb. By the way, the, the difference between an atomic bomb, just to, do we have a more moment? Sure. Okay. It's a qualitative difference between an atomic bomb and the conventional bombing that the United States was doing at the time. We could do the same damage with conventional weapons that we could do with an atomic bomb. I just told you about Tokyo as an example, right? We killed 84,000 in one night, uh, destroyed over 250,000 buildings, and uh, burned down a quarter of a city. The difference was instead of taking two, three, four hundred bombers to do that with conventional munitions, we could do it with a single bomber. The qualitative difference was what? Radiation. How much did we know about radiation at the time? Well, again, we have revisionists who want to make the argument that that was a huge deal and that we knew what the effects of that were. Well, here's some facts to keep in mind as far as how much did we really know about radiation. In the first place, uh, at the Alamogorda test in, on uh, July 16th down in the New Mexico desert, we had scientists who were involved with the Manhattan Project within f a little over five miles of the blast. And in fact, Truman got information saying that the blast wave was powerful enough that it actually knocked some of those guys off their feet. So here are guys that know exactly what they're dealing with, an atomic bomb, a nuclear bomb, one, one that has radiation. And they are so close to the bomb explosion that they allowed themselves to be knocked off their feet. Clearly, the blast wave had what in it? Radiation, right? So here's that's first item. From that point on, all the way up until the early 1960s, the United States conducted all kinds of nuclear tests in the United States, many of which included veterans of the various services, Marines and soldiers, who literally in some cases were within a couple miles, even closer than the scientists I was just talking about, in a trench. The blast wave passed over them, and after the blast wave passed over, they walked to the epicenter of the blast. They did this so many times that we actually have what we call atomic veterans. And we paid, uh, if, you, if you use the maximum amount of $75,000, we paid that out to at least almost 11,000 American veterans. This was going on clear into the 1960s. So I ask you the question, how much do we really know about radiation? Certainly at the time of the attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, 
Oh, any other questions? Well, David, thank oh, you. Oh, we so got much. one more here, I guess. Okay. There was um, approximately, uh, you had on there, uh, 28 million Japanese civilians. Civilians. Yeah, that's in addition now, to the military. Oh, well, there, it would take at least 100 Japanese to one American. And I realize that they're not military, but they must have had some power of hiding and knowing where the ins and outs. Like they could have wiped us out. They I might. Feel. They might have. They might have. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you've got those kinds of odds, yeah. six, six million soldiers, all of which, many of which were, like, say, going to be special attack, right? And then you have 28 million civilians up against a force of about three quarters of a million and a million in another case. Yeah, obviously it would have been an incredible bloodletting, whether that was ours, theirs, or a combination thereof, in all probability. Well, also recognizing the terrain of Yes. The island of Japan is quite mountainous. Yes, it is. You know, the only the plain around Tokyo, you know, is relatively flat. But once you withdraw into the mountains, uh, you could have carried on, you know, a bloody war for years. Yes, and that was a concern that they could uh, begin a guerrilla war that could could have gone on okay. indefinitely. Not only in the home islands, but remember. Remember I said on these areas that Japan still occupied, there were a lot of military forces that were in Asia, Japanese military forces, and they were concerned that they might not lay down their arms and we would have a guerrilla war that we would have to fight there that could go on indefinitely. Yeah, what's also interesting is there are some excellent books talking about the end of World War II in Europe and the demobilization that we were doing there. But anyone who is in the aviation side or, or medical side were essentially all being loaded on ships to be sent to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. and, and I met an elderly gentleman who was a doctor with the 11th Armored Division, which was a division my father-in-law was in. And as soon as the fighting started, all of them were loaded up and they were transiting through the Panama Canal uh, when this was... When it ended? Fine, when it ended. Yeah. But well, the they were not alone. Well, probably a lot of you are familiar with the 8th Air Force that was stationed in England and fought the Germans throughout the war. They had already relocated to Okinawa. They hadn't flown any actual bombing missions during the final days in August of 1945. But they had already relocated and had been refitted with B-29s instead of their 17s and 24s. They were already there. So, yes, we were going. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's what I went over, we landed over there in, in uh, the coast of Japan and, and uh, got on the ball, just leaving the ship. Why, uh, there, was, there was only one person there, but there was a girl out there and she was crying and saying, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. And, of course, we just embarked there and, and, uh, and uh, started gathering up weapons. And we got a pile of samurai swords and odds and ends that we couldn't put in this room. It was big, about as big as this building. And piled up everybody. When the, when the emperor said, turn in your weapons, the people turned in their weapons. Yeah. There was no right. argument about it. I mean, it Everything came in. We had rifles and samurai swords and everything you could think of. Well, after we did, got that all gathered up and, and then we, we moved further up into Japan and, and started destroying airplanes and, mm -hmm. and we put those in, just pulled those into circles and threw some boxes of gasoline in there and burned them all up. And the ammunition, we took all the ammunition that we gathered and explosive and put them on a barge and haul that stuff out into the ocean and just sank it. threw it overboard. And uh, we got no resistance at all. I mean, zero resistance. It yeah. Was, it was really kind of odd. Of course, we never had no place to stay. It slept underground and the rats ran over us all night long. If you had the issue of the chocolate bar, you better not take that chocolate bar in the in your, what we call the fart sack. It's a blanket with a zipper on it. 
Ah. Because the rats would be in there and eat it up in the morning. So it was pretty interesting. Were you in the Army, sir, or the yeah, Marine Corps? Yeah, I was in the 33rd. I was in the Army. How long were you in occupation? They How long did you stay in occupation yeah. duty over there? I was over there uh, about a year. Don't look at me. <laughs> 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 you know, that actually was the, even though we had taken the emperor's powers away from him, we, we never did try him as a war criminal. There were people who thought about doing that, uh, but by keeping him around, we kind of got to eat our cake, have our cake and eat it too, uh, because the emperor did exactly what you said. He told the Japanese military, lay down your arms, and they did, yeah. peacefully. So we didn't have to end up we fighting. We'd go home back in there with a, with a boat around it and, and a high wall. And we were told, don't mess around there, just leave them alone. Yeah. And we treated it. Did you get to bring back a samurai sword? I got a half a dozen. Half a dozen? <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, I've actually interviewed a couple of other vets who had samurai swords, so. Cool. Yeah. Very nice. But it was, uh, it was a hard place because you slept on the ground, basically. And, yeah. And, uh, and the guys learned not to sit. They issued you chocolate bars. You didn't take that out of it. And the fart sack was here. Because the rats would be in there. And yeah. Up. Yeah. Oh, it was kind of interesting. Oh, well, thank you. Well, David, I know I oh. think we've given you a Actually, a I don't think you had one of those before, yeah. so I like so it. Cool. I we'd give you a, a, one of our mugs here. Thank Probably you. the last thing you need. No, thank you but very anyway, much. Thank you. Thank you so much Appreciate for joining it. us. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. David, I've got you to the book up here, if you'd like. Uh, come and look at that. Again, this is a fascinating period of time. and certainly reshaped uh, our world, uh, particularly in the Far East decades to come, and saved many lives. I mean, my father was in the Navy in World War II, had a ship sunk, was scheduled to go out there. My father-in-law was in the Army, Leonard Farmer Division in Europe, and he was wounded and already programmed to go to uh, you know, the Far East. Uh, and so many of our generation, the baby boomers, uh, we have, you know, thanks to the use of this, uh, that we are around at all. So please stay around, visit with David, and visit the museum if you haven't. And thank you very much for joining us.